All right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks, Will. Uh, I hope everybody had a great, great Christmas. Uh, my wife and my children are in San Diego currently with my parents who are visiting from Korea, as well as my brother-in-law and my sister-in-law and nephew. Uh, they came in town from Chicago to spend time together, and I can't believe it's the end of the year, fam. It's wild. Like during worship, I couldn't stop crying because I was thinking about where I was last year, January, or this year, January 2020. Actually, going into this year, I was actually extremely scared that I wasn't going to be able to live as healthy as I had hoped to after my sabbatical. And I was just crying, thanking God, because his grace has been so good to me. He's been so kind to me and so faithful to me. So I'm just, I'm actually pretty eager to go into this new year, but I'm also going to miss it. Because for me, 2020 was the hardest year of my life. But 2021 was like, in many ways, it was kind of like this restoration process for me. So I hope for you guys as well as you guys go into the new year, there's a level of excitement and hope and faith and expectation that God is going to do some new things in your lives. Amen? Amen. So I hope you guys had a great, great Christmas as we uh, go into this last sermon or the last message of the year. I actually really hope this message um, could potentially transform your life. When I first um, heard of this idea of sustaining grace or the cycle of grace last year and I actually adopted it into my lifestyle it was without exaggeration transformative so I'm pretty excited to give a message for us this year or this Sunday as we go into the new year and I really believe it could it could change your life if you actually put it into practice so before we begin uh, let me let me pray for us God, would you just bless our time? Would you anoint my lips? Would you anoint our hearts to receive whatever it is that you want us to receive today, God? Father, as we center our hearts this morning, the last Sunday of 2021, like Will was sharing, we open our hands to give and to receive from you, God. So Holy Spirit, Move in our lives over the next 30 minutes. Would you do something special? In your name we pray. Amen. All right, as you can tell on the screen, the title of my message this morning is Sustaining Grace. Could you guys say Sustaining Grace? Sustaining grace. One more time, Sustaining Grace. Sustaining. When I say Sustaining Grace, I simply mean the sustaining power and the sustaining energy of God that God gives us in order for us to live and be and accomplish the things that he's called us to do. When God asks us to live a certain way and to do certain things, he doesn't just leave us to ourselves. He actually gives us the substance and the sustaining power for us to be able to accomplish all that he wants us to do. When you read the New Testament, it's really interesting. Almost every time you see the word grace, right afterwards, you also see the word power. You see grace and power like two wings to a bird whenever you see Apostle Paul or the New Testament talking about the grace of God. And what that means is where there is the grace of God, 
there is the power and the energy and the substance of God for us to live the way that God has called us to live. In 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9, Apostle Paul says, For my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. He says in Ephesians chapter 3, I think it's verse 17, he says, I became a servant of the gospel by the grace of God and through the power of God's love in me. The Bible will even say that Stephen, while he was being martyred, he was being stoned to death. You know, we get stoned on Instagram posts and Facebook posts, but back in the day, there were literal stones to martyr and persecute followers of Jesus. And the Bible says while he was being stoned, he was filled with grace and power. So there is a way that we can receive a sustaining grace as we go into this new year to be able to live in the wholeness and fullness of God. It's not just a way, it's a promise. It's actually a guarantee for those of us who will be willing to receive and adopt the ways of Christ. The reason why I'm sharing today about sustaining grace as we go into the new year is this. At the end of the year, we're all getting ready for new goals. Come on, somebody. New diets. Amen. I didn't care about my diet until I turned 30. I don't know what's going on. I can't eat meat no more past 8 o'clock. My stomach starts turning late at night. I ate ice cream. I started turning at 2, 3 in the morning. I don't know what's going on. Ever since I turned 30, sometimes I wake up injured. <laughs> I went to sleep fine, but I wake up with my neck kind of messed up. But as we go into the new year, you know that gyms make most of their money in the last month of the year and the first month of the year. December and January is where they get the most new registrations. Why? New goals, new diets and New Year's resolutions. But if we are to be honest with ourselves, maybe a few of you who are really strong-willed, but most of us, we never succeed. I've been, uh, uh, we're moving into a new house in a few weeks, and I've been telling my wife, I want to, I want to make a home gym. She's like, yeah, right. <laughs> She's like, make sure you spend only a couple hundred dollars before you go crazy, because let's see if you actually make it to March, right? So here is my invitation for us this morning. Rather than setting up new goals, even though goals are helpful and resolutions do make some sort of a difference, how about we adopt a new way of living? Rather than just setting up one or two, three goals for us to accomplish and achieve this year, like I'm going to do this, I'm not going to do that, I'm going to eat this, I'm not going to eat that. Rather than that, why don't we embrace a new way of living that as a result just by the fruit of living that way, you will be transformed as a means to adopting a new way of living. That is why in our community, one of the greatest visions of our church is holistic discipleship. Is seeing all things in life as a means for us to experience the with God life. When people ask me, what is the vision of Beloved Church? And when I don't use fancy words like behold, become, I say holistic discipleship. Reaching those far from Christ and holistic discipleship. And my heart for us today is to talk about this idea of sustaining grace. So that as we go into this new year, by the end of this year, you will realize, wow, my life has been transformed, not just a few areas, and just a few resolutions. In 1962, there's a guy named Dr. Frank Lake. He was a psychiatrist, and he was, 1962, he started an organization called the Clinical Theology Association. The Clinical Theology Association, and as a psychiatrist, he wanted to help pastors and leaders to understand how psychology impacts the spirituality of congregation members to pastors. And Dr. Frank Lake, he worked very closely with a missions organization that sent British missionaries to India in the 1960s and 70s. And this organization was specifically partnered with people in their 20s, 30s, and 40s. 
and send these young British missionaries to India. But this is what began to happen. Within one year, majority of them will come back to Britain, burnt out, discouraged, and even some of them lost their faith. They were some of the most eager, passionate, on fire, excited Christians you could find of all of Britain. But just within one year, they would come back so tired, exhausted, burnt out, and even angry at God. And Dr. Frank Lake was like, we need to address this issue with this missions organization. See, some of us going into this new year, you have so many goals and so many things you're looking forward to. But if you're not careful and you set expectations higher than the flesh can fulfill, you're also going to get tired, exhausted, and you might even give up on God. I've been in church long enough where youth kids will come up to altar calls and say, I'm going to die for Jesus. And they deny Jesus 24 hours later. <laughs> I've guest spoken enough at conferences and revival services where people are like, I'm going to fast 40 days, and they last two hours, right? They can't do it because they think it's a self-will, self-power. And Dr. Frank Lake, he partnered with a theologian named Emil Bruner, and this is what they said. They said, hey, we got to address this issue. Let's begin to study and research and survey these missionaries about why they were giving up on their call to go to India. But let's also study the life of Jesus. And they did a deep study in the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And they said Jesus faced enormous pressure. He was bombarded by opposition by haters and lovers, he had intense stress everywhere he went. But how was it that he so faithfully and joyfully fulfilled his calling? And they began to study the life of Jesus. And they said, what did he do and how did he live his life so that he was able to live a life of sustaining grace and power? And we're going to unpack this framework that I first heard about a year and a half ago at this leadership retreat with only 24 uh, nonprofit leaders and pastors that transformed my life. So if you look at this diagram on the screen, they called it the cycle of grace. The cycle of grace. And they said that when they studied the life of Christ, he lived in what they called the cycle of grace. The first thing I want you guys to notice on this diagram is that it's divided by input and output. On the second top half, there's the word input and output. And they said, look, if you study the life of Christ, he had a pattern of receiving and giving, of getting input and then output. And it was very well balanced so that he wasn't obese and overweight, but he also wasn't malnutrition, spiritually speaking. But he actually had a rhythm of receiving, getting, before he gave. And they said that these missionaries were not living in this pattern of receiving, and they were just only on the front lines getting beat and defeated. There's this word called retreat in the military. Whenever you're in a battle and you are losing a war, one of the most humiliating and yet one of the best strategic words you could yell is retreat. Retreat means getting away from the front lines so that you can rekindle, you can re-strategize to move forward. And they said these missionaries were so caught up in battle, they forgot to retreat from the front lines of life to receive energy and grace and power from God. And there's these four things that they saw Jesus specifically center his life around. And I hope we can take this home with us today. The first thing that they said that Jesus did in input was acceptance. The next slide. Jesus moved and lived and worked from knowing that he was accepted. That he did not need to perform in front of his supervisor. He did not need to 
behave a certain way in front of his new girlfriend. He didn't have to act a certain way in front of his in-laws and different from his partner. But he knew deep down that his identity was secure in the love of God. That Jesus had this inner confidence that came from knowing he was deeply accepted by God the Father. That's one of our key messages in our community, right? God the Father says to Jesus on three separate occasions, You are my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. My soul is well pleased with you. He hears that before he starts ministry. He hears that in the middle of ministry. And then he hears it right before he gets crucified. Why? Because he needs to hear that over and over and over again. Can I be transparent with you guys? Every Sunday before I preach, when you see me here, you think I'm praying. I'm just saying, I am not my sermon. God, if, I, if, I, if people fall asleep while I'm preaching, glory to God, because at least you're awake. <laughs> if nobody pays attention, at least you see me. If nobody comes this Sunday morning, at least I know you're here. Majority of my time with God lately is continuing to live in this place of acceptance, knowing that I'm loved. But not only that, Dr. Frank Lake, as a psychiatrist, he takes it further. He says not only did he have God the Father's love, he also had a parental love from Mary. He had a mother who loved him so dearly. And he goes farther and says his biological father, Joseph, loved him so much when Herod decreed, murder all the firstborn children of Israel, Joseph says, let's get out of here and let's be foreigners and refugees in Egypt. And it says that Jesus had in his humanity a sense of acceptance from his earthly mother and father. He knew there were people around him that let his hair down. He could just be himself. I wonder, do you have people in your life where you can just be yourself? Do you have friends or do you have parents or do you have a partner or a church community where you don't have to perform? You don't have to act like you're walking with God. You could just be yourself, fam. Amen? Yeah. Look, as your pastor, if you're sinning, I ain't judging you because I ain't better than you at all. <laughs> you just don't see it because I'm up here preaching. Is knowing that you are fully accepted by God, even in your sin, in your brokenness. And the second thing that they said that Jesus patterned his life after in the cycle of grace is what they call sustenance. Sustenance. Sustenance are activities and practices that re-engaged him and refilled him and renewed him to love God. Obviously, we talked about during Advent season that Jesus was fully God, but in his humanity, he had certain practices, certain rhythms, certain disciplines that would sustain his energy and that would allow the grace of God to flow inside of him and eventually to flow through him. He surrounded his life around these things. If acceptance is the pure inflow of God's love, sustenance is the merging of the work of God and the work of man to come together to receive what God wants to do. It's the grace of God poured into us, but it's also the activity of man to do certain things to allow God's grace to flow. If we don't center certain practices and rhythms and disciplines into our lives, we will not have the grace and power and energy of God flowing through us. Some people think I pray because I want to. I hate praying. Can I say that as a pastor? <laughs> it's so hard. I pray because I have to. Because <laughs> I'll die if I don't. <laughs> I don't pray because I like to. I pray because when I pray, my depression begins to diminish. When I pray, God's grace begins to flow. When I pray, I get into a right mind. When I pray, God gives me strength. I don't pray because I want to. I pray because I have to. I don't read the word because I want to. I would rather be on Instagram. I'm preaching to somebody. I would rather be on Netflix or Disney watching Hawkeye. Come on, somebody. But the reason why I read the word of God is because the world is lying to me. The world is deceptive. The world is stumbling me. But when I read the word of truth, it gives me clarity and a sound mind. I read the word because I have to. 
I kind of like it too, though, for real. But still, <laughs> primarily because I have to. And they said that Jesus lived in this cycle of grace, of sustenance, where he was able to receive grace upon grace. Let me ask you a question. What are some activities that you think Jesus did under sustenance? Just take a moment to think for about 10 to 50 seconds. What are some things that you think that Jesus engaged in on a regular basis to receive sustenance? What practices, what rhythms, what disciplines? Now let me show you what Dr. Frank Lake and Emil Bruner came up with. They just pulled up, not, this is not a perfect list, but this is what they noticed. They noticed that Jesus regularly practiced silence and solitude, a time of being alone and a time being silent in the presence of God. They noticed that Jesus meditated and memorized scripture. I mean, Jesus has scripture in his back pocket the way some of us have BTS lyrics in our back pocket. He just knew the word of God. You would see Jesus in the synagogue worshiping on a regular basis to the point when he was 12 years old, his parents forgot him there. He was going to church on a regular basis to be renewed and refilled. He had deep friendships. A lot of people don't, don't think about this. We know that he had disciples like Peter, James, and John and all these other people. But did you guys know every time he went to Bethany, he stayed at Mary and Lazarus and Martha's house. This is what they said. Imagine when you go to a city, when you go to Chicago, when you go to L.A., when you go to, I don't know, any other major city, who do you call? You usually call your friend because you feel most comfortable staying with those you know. They say that Jesus had deep friendships with people like Mary, Martha, and Lazarus where he was able to just be. And that was actually an area of sustenance. They said he had community, obviously, with his apostles and disciples. He practiced Sabbath. He practiced prayer. Here's when it gets fun. He had good food and good drinks. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. Anybody? It says that he enjoyed nature. You would see him out in the ocean. You would see him out on a boat. He went outside to enjoy nature. He even partied and had fun. Some of you are like, what? Yes. <laughs> Matthew 11, the religious leaders called Jesus a party animal in our translation. They called him a glutton and a drunkard. So if I'm wearing this orange jacket and you think I'm a party animal, amen to God. Now, right, it's like, they actually called Jesus a glutton. They called him a drunkard. Why? Because Jesus would go to weddings and celebrate and drink alcohol. Jesus even turned water into wine. Uh-oh, oh my goodness. Jesus knew how to have fun. Jesus had some bomb food. Imagine, Jesus made it himself. He turned stones into bread. He multiplied fish. and He had great food. And then Dr. Frank Lake said these missionaries were living way too intense, more intense than Jesus because of a religious spirit. They didn't know how to relax and enjoy the good gifts of God. Jesus was even accused, why aren't you fasting? He's like, I'm not religious. I already did my 40-day fast, but when I leave my disciples with fast right now, it's a time to celebrate. So he drank alcohol. Here's a funny story. Um, I don't drink often, but I drink on occasion. And um, I, when, from the moment I got saved until actually last year, I didn't drink any alcohol because I used to have um, substance abuse issues. But, you know, every now and then over the last year, I'll drink on occasion when I'm hanging out with some church leaders or we're doing something. <laughs> oh, man, I don't know if I should say this. <laughs> hey, edit this out if this comes off bad. A couple weeks ago, we had a staff Christmas party, and I drank one beer while we were just talking. And my wife told me I was praying at the end, and my face was red, and my breath smelled like alcohol. She was like, honey. <laughs> she said, I was like, go, we give you glory. And David so was like, oh, Pastor Will, I can smell your alcohol. This might sound weird to you, but that's what Jesus did too. 
He actually drank with his disciples. He never got drunk because the Bible is against getting drunk. But to enjoy the good things of life as a grace of God is actually sustenance. Obviously, if you struggle with substances, you want to stay away from that. But Jesus was accused of being a drunkard and a party animal. Because he had rhythms of receiving love and life from these activities. There was a sense of playfulness he had. He always played with children. All children were drawn to him. I don't know about y'all. I don't want any children around me but my own. Because I am tired. <laughs> tired. <laughs> so tired. Do you guys know three weeks ago? This is not a joke. My wife and I, on Saturday night, we got home after a long day. We put both our kids to sleep, and we sat on the couch, and we both started crying because we were tired. I've never experienced that in my life. I looked at my wife, and I was like, honey, I'm so tired, I feel like crying. And when I said that, I started crying. And then my wife started crying, and I was like, and we have to wake up at 6 a.m. tomorrow, and I got to go and preach. A.K.A. thank your parents. Glory to God. Thank your moms more specifically. Tired, exhausted. Jesus actually took naps. Jesus was so tired on the boat, they were like, we gotta, we gotta be intense. He's like, I'll be back, I'm gonna take a nap. <laughs> so one of the most spiritual things you can do in 2022 is rest better, sleep better. Take more days off at work. Beloved teams, volunteers, tell me and our leaders you can't serve this Sunday because you're actually tired. One of the most spiritual things you could do is rest. And here's the last thing that they observe. Jesus will walk from city to city to city to city, and they observe he probably walked anywhere from 5 to 10 miles a day. That means he actually had physical activity and he was physically healthy. He actually had a holistic approach to his spirituality. You know why I'm mentioning this? I'm going to assume when I ask the question, what activities do you think Jesus practiced in for sustenance? Most of us probably thought of, he probably prayed, he fasted, he read the Bible. I could almost guarantee none of y'all thought he partied, <laughs> he drank, he had good friends, he walked many miles a day. Why? Because most Christians live a disintegrated life. We think God only cares about our spiritual life. No, God cares about all of our life. We think God only cares about our prayer life. No, he also cares about our public life. A lot of us think God only cares about my Sunday. No, he also cares about our Monday. He cares about your finances. He cares about your mental health. He cares about your relationships. He cares about your job. He cares about your family. He cares about all of your life. And when you look at the life of Christ, he lived a holistic life. I was talking to my dad as he was in town this week. He's like, son, what's, been God, what's God been doing in your life? And I told him, you know what, dad? Ever since my mental and emotional breakdown in 2020, I realized my life was too intense. Did you guys know in 2020, 2020 alone, I fasted 21 days two times and 40 days one time? You're like, oh, Pastor Will, spiritual. No, that's how religious and intense I was. I was 138 pounds after my 40-day fast. I lost almost 35 pounds. And my wife was like, I need you to stop fasting so you can help with the kids. <laughs> I know you're praying, but I kind of need help with the dishes. I'm like, I can't do the dishes. I'm tired. <laughs> now, fasting is great. I still fast, but the thing was my life was too unbalanced. I'm going to say one last thing, and then we'll move on to the third thing. A few weeks ago, once a month, I do a monthly retreat where I go away for, 20, for about 32 hours by myself. I take my Bible, I take my journal, and I just go. I typically go to a beach area, and I just spend time with God. And I have a one-hour session with a spiritual director. And they're kind of like therapists, but they're more in the spiritual formation stream, and we talk about how I'm doing. And almost every session, they start with this question. It's a very formation question. They say, what is God stirring in your heart? Because they have this belief system that God moves within us. 
delight yourself in the Lord and I will give you the desires of your heart. So this idea that God and the Holy Spirit reside. So she said, what's, what's stirring in your heart? And I told her this, I want to go on vacation. And she says, oh, okay, let's, let's dig deep into this. I was like, I don't know if I could say this. Our church just started, but I just want to have fun. I was like, even this last 12 hours being here, I didn't want to pray. I didn't want to journal. All I wanted to do was go out and eat good food, and I wish my wife was here. She said, okay, let's, let's dig into this. And she said this, do you think God cares about your fun? And I was like, no. <laughs> and I was like, I'm, I'm sure he does, but that's probably not on his priority. This is what she said. Do you care if your daughter has fun? And at this age, that's all I care about. She's like, Daddy, I want Elsa. I was like, I'll bring Elsa home tomorrow. I'll find somebody to wear a wig, show up and be Elsa for you. She's like, Daddy, let's play. I just play, 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 and I want her to have fun. And he's like, can I just suggest the way you want your daughter to have fun? Maybe God wants you to have fun like that too. It felt so weird. I was like, no, God wants me to preach. God wants me to fast. She's like, look, remember the cycle of grace? And then she's the one that pointed out, do you remember that they called him a drunkard and a glutton? And then we started digging into my childhood as an Asian immigrant. And I was like, fun? There's no such thing as fun. <laughs> it's work hard. <laughs> Study. <laughs> Hierarchy. Culture. And I started crying, praying about having fun. And I left that formation session. I went to my journal. I was like, I'm going on vacation. <laughs> I called my wife. I said, honey, second week of January, we're going to Carlsbad and we're going to the Hilton. Don't ask me how much money we have. We're doing it. <laughs> I said, points all day, baby. Points, points, points. I'm telling you guys right now, as we go into this new year, don't just set up secondary goals. Think about a sustaining grace, your holistic life as you go into discipleship. The third thing, or actually, before, if you go back to that same graph with acceptance and sustenance, notice this. They put the input, if you look at this circle, it's thicker on the input and thinner on the output. They notice that Jesus spent more time around input than output. In order for him to live a sustainable and overflowing life of love, joy, and peace, he actually spent more time receiving and inputting than giving. Some of us, we are busier serving than receiving. We are busier giving than receiving. And they noticed that Jesus spent 90% of his life anonymously and only 10% publicly. 30 years in private, receiving, preparing, getting trained. Three years in public. And that was why he was able to in, in, in endure enormous pressure, enormous opposition, because he received more than he gave. Fascinating. The third thing they say is significance. Now this is when we go towards output. Jesus first knew he was accepted, and then he lived in a sustenance. He lived in sustenance, and then as he moves outwards, he goes into significance. When they use the word significance, significance in, the word, in Latin it comes from the word sign. And what they observed is that significance simply means this. What does your life signify, and what does your life point to? Jesus' significance came from obeying God and giving glory to God. His significance did not come from how much money he had in his bank account, how much real estate and stocks he had, the relationships that he had, and how much popularity and power and fame he had, but his significance came from showing and giving God glory. He knew his purpose was not simply to be famous or powerful or relevant. It was to be obedient to God the Father. If you look at these three verses in John chapter 5, verse 19, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, the Son of Man can do nothing by himself. He only does what he sees the Father doing. John 14, 9, Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? 
even after I've been among you for such a long time. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? John 5, 17, Jesus replied, my Father is always working and so am I. And what Dr. Frank Lake and Emma Bruner observed was because he knew he was accepted and he lived in substance, he knew his purpose. It was to obey God and to point to the glory of God. He knew that his significance came by giving God honor and glory. That means your jobs are for the sake of giving God glory. That means your school and your education is to give God honor. That means your relationships is to show the kingdom of God. That means at work, you're supposed to embody the kingdom of God of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You're supposed to exude the realities of the kingdom. And that's what Jesus did. And lastly, the fourth thing that they noticed was, and finally, there was fruitfulness. Finally, as a result, he bore fruit. He did great things. He healed the sick. He fed the hungry. He set prisoners free. He clothed the naked. He elevated the dignity of Gentiles and women. He led a spiritual revival. He died on the cross for our sins. But that was the thinnest of all things because that was just a byproduct of who he was. Fruitfulness came at the end of his life. And here is how they concluded. They studied the life of Jesus, and then they looked at these missionaries in India, and they noticed these missionaries lived in the exact opposite cycle of Jesus. They lived in what they called the cycle of works. If you look at this, in the cycle of works, Jesus started from acceptance and went to sustenance and significance. But these missionaries started from fruitfulness. They were living to achieve. They were living to save souls. They were living to build churches. They were living to reach the lost. They were doing good work, but that was their priority. We need to succeed. And they started from fruitfulness. And if they were fruitful, they felt significant. If they had a gift of evangelism or a gift of leadership or a gift of preaching and they're oh we're doing good God's using us but those who didn't they felt insignificant they felt like God abandoned them they felt like God you're not real why did I go up for the altar call that pastor tricked me he was a salesman (laughs) that worship music that was emotionalism I hate Danny (laughs) they made me cry and they manipulated me and made me receive Jesus because they live for fruitfulness and when they were not successful they felt insignificant and as a result substance was just, it was i'm going to pray cuz at the last minute i have to i have to preach so i'm going to pray <laughs> that was the last thing they thought and then if i am successful and fruitful then i'll be accepted and they noticed these missionaries and may i suggest perhaps you and me live in this way i put these two side by side next to us for each other And look at this. Jesus starts in the cycle of grace, acceptance, sustenance, significance, fruitfulness. These missionaries, these young people, these passionate entrepreneurial Christians, they started from fruitfulness, significance, sustenance, and acceptance. Here's my invitation for us today. Would you embrace the cycle of grace? Can you put up that slide of sustenance when I had the practices of Jesus where it actually said sustenance, science, solitude, scripture, meditation, work? Look at that. I want you guys to take a look at this. Where are you imbalanced? I'm going to be completely transparent with you. For me, this past year, I have not read the scriptures like I used to. Some of that is because of my trauma and PTSD, being a pastor for so long, I just couldn't do it. But I am going to party and have fun, okay? I'm not playing when I say that. (laughs) I don't know how to have fun. A few years ago, Jason Nettles asked me, Will, what do you like to do uh, on your free time? I was like, free time? (laughs) Jason looked at me like, what? I was like, I read. (laughs) He's like, bro. (laughs) 
2022, don't be shocked if I show up looking, I'm playing, right? But partying and fun, and for me, scripture, I'm here, my question to you, what is an area for you? Maybe it's science and solitude, maybe it's Sabbath, maybe it's community, maybe you got to commit to a church, maybe others of you is, I got to go out in nature, I got to go out to the beach, I got to go to the mountains, maybe other of you, I, I got I to have some fun, I got to stop being so serious, other, I need deep friendships, I need to bear my soul. I need to tell my friend, this is what I'm, this is what I'm struggling with. Here, here are my sins. I want you to ask yourself, where in this world or this uh, category of substance are you lacking? And can you just live a more holistic life as you go into this new year? And as we close, I'm going to read one verse to us in Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. And if I could have the praise team come up here. This is what Jesus says. Come to me. All who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Two things, and we'll land this plan. You know when it says the word yoke here? The first century, even now, a yoke is this wooden piece of furniture that they would use to get two oxen to attach on their necks as they plow the ground. So they put it on two different animals. I, in fact, have a picture for you. And they, they put it on these, and they walk this way. And that's how they plow the ground. But in the first century, and uh, uh, a rabbi in the first century Jewish education system, they will look at their Talmudin. A Talmudin is, is, is disciple in Hebrew. And they would say, take my yoke. And what Jesus is saying is, my yoke is light. My burden is easy. He's saying, take my teachings. Take my lifestyle. Take my practices. And you'll be filled with life. Don't take the yoke of our culture and our society that tells you you need to achieve, you need to be successful, you need to be big. Don't, don't hear the lies of the enemy that says you're nothing if you're not rich, you're nothing when you sin, you're nothing. But take my yoke of forgiveness, take my yoke of love, take my yoke of patience and peace and re- take that and you'll find rest for your souls. Some of you are not tired, but you're restless. Your, your busy body, your eyes are wandering. You want more and more. And like Will was saying during offering, I want to tell you something. Jesus wants to give you something so much better. I don't care if you grew up in church. We can grow up in church and not grow up in grace, not grow up in Christ. Going into this new year, would you take his yoke, the yoke of Christ, his teachings, But how do we do that? It's not just sustenance. He says, come to me. My arms are so wide. I died on the cross for you. Come to me. I love you. I want to give you joy. I'll say one last thing. Jesus didn't die to get you to heaven. He died to give heaven to you now. He didn't die that you would go there and be free. He died so you could be free now. He died so depression could leave now. He died so anxiety could leave now. He died so sin could break now. But we must embrace the lifestyle of Christ. And that's a gift to you as you go into this new year. Can we close our eyes?